We have to learn how to understand and speak outside of our realm as engineers. The engineer conversation and dialogue should never even happen in a creative conversation in a session. It should never be brought up. It's what exists in the background so the creativity can flow. That's a theme song. It really is, yeah. Yeah, that got me going tonight. Mm-hmm. I had a little yeah. bit of a muscle memory reaction. It was like my body started getting into podcast mode That's before what my I brain mean. did. Mm-hmm. It's like it's like sharpens you up. The hazel rigs really killed that one. They really it's did. It's one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where are we at today? How's Jeez. everybody feeling? Man. I, I'm I'm just swimming in ideas. Really? And, and grasping... <laughs> Get us going, man. I'm swimming in ideas and grasping for how to handle it. Um, I like that. I have no ideas and I have... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been... I've been I, see, I, I, I see and experience so many things that I just wish I could transplant into your heads and many other people's heads. Things, ideas, people would enjoy. Mm. Um, I had this... You know, I have this experience with music too. I hear music and I'm like, oh, I got a fucking Dexter will love this. Mm-hmm. Or, and, and I have like a good habit of sending music off to people in a way that isn't burdensome to them, I hope. Mm-hmm. Um, but, with, but with ideas, it's, it's different. And, and sending, you know, three hour videos to people, oh, watch this one too. It's, <laughs> it's, it's all like a bit much. Um, and sometimes I've, you know, screen captured like short clips and sent those, and and that's that's been really a punchy and efficient way to get like specific ideas across mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and perspective, and just the way certain people say things, or just the fact that it's a certain person saying it, even if it's a thing we've been, you know, bandying about. Um, it brings validation. It, it tells us we're on the right track, or you know, whatever it does um, brings pleasure to to me and to us. Um, and so I've been thinking about uh, a kind of workflow for like capturing clips from podcasts and, and videos and some way to share. And mm, That's really cool. I think about doing it all the time and I get lazy and I never do it. Like an eight minute yeah. clip or something that I but really I, hit I, home. I yeah. spend the time taking it in and I wonder if it wouldn't be more fruitful if I was like in a little bit more of a production. If I had like a production move every time something's on the TV, I can just go to the phone, boom, put a clip, go in a folder and then... Mm-hmm. You know, mm. um, I think it could be a powerful way to disseminate the best of the best of mm-hmm. what I'm getting mm-hmm. um, since I'm spending so much time taking it in. Why know? don't you pick one of those ideas and start us off here? Oh, God. I mean, hot seat. Brian Eno. Like, who fucking knew the guy was so interesting? Everyone's been telling me all these years. I think a lot of years. people thought he was really. <laughs> I, everyone's so telling me all these years. Oh, you remind me. Right no, I've never listened to Brian Eno speak. He's brilliant. Mm. He is and, brilliant. Yeah. And so last night and the night before, I think that I've taken in like full three full lectures from mm. him. And there's some overlap in two of them. Um, his thing about art was interesting and it speaks to our our discussion about art and design. Like mm. what's the mm-hmm. difference? And his illustration or demonstration is the screwdriver. He's like, a hundred screwdrivers will have different handles in the same exact tip. He's like the design part, like this, this tip of the screwdriver has a specific use and it can't change, but the handle can be anything. Mm. It's anything you want it to be. And that's what art is. It's anything where you're making a stylistic choice. And Mm. he then shows some, some, uh, screwdrivers that have like fringe on them. And they're like from the women's section of some website or something It's kind of some kind of silly thing. Uh, but then he talks about haircuts and he's like, all of you have made artistic choices about your hair. It's like your hair could be on these various axes, like masculine to feminine or, and, and, and that has changed over time, or it could be, um, uh, look controlled or wild. Um, there are all these various, you know, like seven or eight different 
axes crossing the same point. And he's like, all of your haircuts are on, can be plotted on this chart. Um, and, um, but you all don't walk around thinking like you're artists. You know, it's it's just that's just the first thing that pops into my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, love, it's love. it's like defining we, art is something you don't need to do. We've had hours. Exactly. <laughs> it's funny. We've had hours uh, with this debate at this table with different people, and that's kind of been my my grand pushback. It's like you don't have to define it. What it doesn't it doesn't have to serve a purpose. It could. Well, you do when you're getting money for art schools from the government and trying to d express its value. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but yeah. But you don't when you're making a pop song, which is our. Well, you do. Well, that's a, I mean. No, I mean, we could talk about that because that, that's where we came at this debate from. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about yeah, top, is top 40 uh, design or art? Yeah. Is it, are you designing it because there's a, there's a format that it has to exist in? Is there yeah. a certain type of arrangement? Yeah. Then is it purely functional or is it artistic? And I've come at it purely artistically yeah. and you've pushed back up from the other I side. I said it can be artful, but it doesn't need to be mm -hmm. because. But w from that definition, yeah any stylistic intent encoded in it from anyone else makes it art. So therefore it's going to be, whether it has to be or not yeah. becomes irrelevant because nobody's in the room saying, I'm not going to try to make art today. I'm going to just try to make a song that's utilitarian. But it is a screwdriver. It's in four, four. It's in a single key. Doesn't have to be. Could be. Doesn't have to be. Well, top there are six, eight records that make top 40. Yeah. But we not know, 13, 17. Sure. I, That's what I mean. Like the tip of the screwdriver doesn't change. Mm -hmm. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's it's that's mm -hmm. what I mean by design. It's like it has to function. Like it ha it can't be too intellectual. It's a actually very narrow. If what you're going to dance to it, the tempos are limited. Yes, it can't be four BPM and it can't be four hundred. Yeah, if you're going to shake your ass to it, you know. Yes. Can I play a, a, an Eno clip? Please. Mm -hmm. It's from a record, but I think it'll get fucked up enough by the mic that it won't be. Okay. It's not music, it's speech, but it's it's like two minutes. Cool. I like it. Um, let's let's find it, out. Yeah, let's hear it. Let's see if it works. Itself, about beauty, about the, the source of the, of the art. I'm trying good. to make a film that's beautiful in itself, about beauty, about the, the source of the, of the art, rather than everything that surrounds the art. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I was hoping that you might say a couple of words about that subject matter, because, you know, you've always operated... Uh, in a relatively quiet way, and yet you're like a, a world artist. Well, I tell you, one thing I would say about your film is that what would be really interesting for people to see is how beautiful things grow out of shit. <laughs> because <laughs> nobody ever believes that. You know, everybody thinks that Beethoven had his string quartets completely in his head. They somehow appeared there and formed in his head before he... And all he had to do was write them down and they would kind of be manifest to the world. But I think what's, what's so interesting, what would really be a lesson that, that everybody should learn is that things come out of nothing. Things evolve out of nothing. You know, the, the tiniest seed in the right situation turns into the most beautiful forest. And then the most promising seed in the wrong situation turns into nothing. Um, and I think this would be important for people to understand because it gives people confidence in their own lives to know that that's how things work. Mm -hmm. If you walk around with the idea that there are some people who are so gifted, they have these wonderful things in their head, but you're not one of them, you're just sort of a normal person, you could never do anything like that, then you live a different kind of life. You, know? you, you could have another kind of life where you can say, where you say, well, I know that things come from nothing very much and start from unpromising beginnings and i'm an unpromising beginning hmm. Hmm. wow like that, that resonates with uh, our dinner table discussion yeah. really highly <laughs> that's, um, i was gonna say that should be the intro that's mm -hmm. lanwa mm. uh daniel lanwa <laughs> interviewing him for there's a, a a film and record that he made sort of um together called here is what is mm -hmm. maybe i don't know 15 years ago maybe no, maybe 13 years ago. I went heavy on it at the time when we had our house in Ireland. Um, we have a huge living room and we had a projector that would project over the fireplace in a nice stereo. And 
I would just project the movie over and over and, and they're, they're talking that scene mm. and it really struck me, you know, it's, mm. it's cause I, I really did have, when, when he said that, I d- really did have that idea that like, well, geniuses are geniuses and I'm not one. Yeah. So, mm. you know, I've met some and, you know, mm. I've seen people, even in Ireland, I had met some and, uh, and you're kind of like, well, I, I'm not that. So, so we're out of luck. Yeah. I mean, so many of the themes and ideas that we were into here at the table were reflected in in that um, in these uh, Brian Eno videos that I saw in these lectures and these talks. Um, I mean, even in the Q and A, like somebody would ask a question about um, how do you, um, you know, how are you so prolific or whatever, and he's like, oh, it's because. I get somebody outside the project to come in and listen. Like, <laughs> there's like all the stuff. Like, mm-hmm. um, it was so validating. It's so interesting. And I felt such kinship with his thinking. And, and at the same time, it was like so frustrating to me that I grind away on certain ideas that have already been like mm-hmm. put into better words. And you know, it's, it's just like all of this existing previous work in the world that is for whatever reason, I haven't crossed paths with it. It hasn't, I haven't like built on what's been done. I feel like I'm just spending time catching up, <laughs> you know. So you're, you're admitting to us that you don't know everything there is to know. Is this, is this what we're <laughs> learning? He's facing at the table that tonight? reality right that's now. That's relevant. Yeah, 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 that's relevant, directly yeah. relevant to us, our well being, the well being of the people that we serve, that mm. we care for. Sure. You know, it's mm-hmm. I, yeah. It's the dissemination of good ideas. I don't um, lament I don't lament the the not knowing everything because clearly I was joking and that's absurd. But I do lament not having a good education to build on yeah. an education in classics and an education yeah. in history and an education in I I sort of had limited opportunities and squandered the ones I had and and uh, and really um you know you, you're hamstrung by that your whole life um mm. it really changes how I the advice I would give younger people you know yeah and not necessarily go and spend two hundred thousand dollars on a degree in, from Stanford but but definitely um building blocks I mean because, the Greeks figured some shit out yeah that still stands you know oh, it's it, yeah. and, and like there's so much. There's so much value in what's in what's been done. Um, I think like <laughs> I kept thinking all week about songwriting, right? Something I've done since I was a kid, something I enjoy. Um, and I was thinking about in, like when I when I grew up in Philadelphia, New Jersey, and like the Jersey Shore, like there was this stark separation between cover bands and original bands oh yeah Mm -hmm. right yeah oh you're in a cover band oh you do original Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. there was a sort of class separation same where i was from and Mm -hmm. the cover bands made all the money and the venues Mm -hmm. you know they could they could sustain doing doing gigs and original bands there's like hardly anywhere to play and you know it was it's like definitely a second tier thing but you're sort of playing long ball Mm -hmm. you know doing your own material and but if you take any random bar in the country and you put in a cover band that's going to play music people know, people have a good time. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. go in and play original music <laughs> that nobody's heard before, there's a good chance that it's not going to be that fun, as mm-hmm. fun as it would be. Mm-hmm. But what does that say? I have to say I've never thought about this before. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I'm, like, I'm thinking back to every song, every, um, every live show I did live sound for when I was the age you're talking about when you were writing the songs. And all the fun people had when the cover records come on that I fucking hated. Yeah. Just like mm-hmm. Sweet Caroline comes on. I'm like, kill me. Yeah. <laughs> like, get me out of here. And then like the band that I'm actually there to do sound for gets on. I'm like, yeah, I love these songs. And everybody leaves and yeah. there's seven dudes left, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's like, whoa. But I haven't, that's really, honestly, really profound. I know, I, I think I know where you're going with this. Back to Trio Mondelez. I wasn't going to say those words. <laughs> all roads. I didn't want to trigger, Mondelez. I didn't want to trigger John. No, 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 no. I know, I know what you mean though and this no, is the yeah. best argument yeah. I have I have felt from you without you even having to argue it. Yeah. I am bending the knee. <laughs> 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 
because uh, there is something about Sweet Caroline that is an American traditional record yes. uh-huh. that gives people so much joy with their vodka tonic. And I'm sitting there with my champagne, like wanting to hear Beethoven. Hmm. And Beethoven's not at the club. Beethoven's yeah. not there. I mean, that's probably a bad example because... Beethoven is has mass appeal in so many other senses. The better version would be like maybe the obscure. Oh, let's go bring Brockhampton back into the it's, conversation. It's our <laughs> yeah. Fire. Yeah. Bring him back, it's, baby. It's, but no, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a specific instance. There's this Irish yeah. pub across the street from me on the Upper West Side when I lived in Upper West Side of Manhattan. But, um, uh, oh, man, this is like the third time I tried to remember it. Um, but I would go in there, just get a drink. Like, just be in the neighborhood, you know, it's right across the street. And I would go to the jukebox and pick, like, it was when the, that, you know, it was like 2001, uh, that Madonna record that came out that year. I forget mm. what it was called. Ray of Light, maybe? So, no, no, after that. Um, Ray of Light the was The one with Mere uh, Ways on it. Yes. And Steve uh, Sedelnik. Um, 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 and there's this song, Mer- Unhappy, Girl? Unhappy Girl on it. I know, yeah. I know the record Happy. you mean. It's a mere ways production, yeah, French, yeah. French producer. Yeah. And I would put that on, and the bartender would go t- switch it off. Mm. <laughs> Fuck. Because it's like depressed sit-at-home music, mm-hmm. and it was like, I don't know, like doesn't sell bumming drinks. people out. doesn't sell drinks, yeah. right? And those two things in my head were like, those are a couple things that popped up out of re-listening to last week's episode about there may be some difference. <laughs> There's definitely uh, a difference between different kinds of music I'd like and, to try, and, and t- its effect on community. I'd like to, or I'd like to tie a little knot uh, around around this, where Rory plays the clip of Brian Eno, and you know, beautiful things can come from shit. And what you're saying is, all odds are stacked against you when you're trying to create something original. And if you play something traditional, it's going to connect immediately, or has a or has a higher chance of connecting. Right. So we're just all at a, um at a um at a loss in the beginning and our chances are are, um, are very far-fetched to have success. Yeah, so, everyone's attempting a heroic right, thing. Right, well, what, right. Yes, yes. Right. And I, I love that. I love that. But what I guess I'm talking about when it comes to uh, music, pop art, uh, pop songs being art and by, by default has to be mm. is that if you don't attempt to uh, inject or encode some profound uh, artistic integrity or or statement that you have even less of a chance. So mm-hmm. everybody's going into creating pop music mm. thinking that they're about to make the next best thing that mm. every bartender is going to want to play and not switch off. Mm. Now, now, granted, if you're talking about a depressed uh, l- l- listen at home piece that will never, there, there's limits there that will never mm. get played at the, mm-hmm. um, but that's a that's one type of record that could go, um, uh, could be uh, attempted in a session, mm-hmm. whether at home or collaboratively. But a lot of people are trying to do the one that gets timeless appeal mm-hmm. um, <laughs> at the bar. Like that's most of the sessions I have been in my yeah, life yeah, in too. this city and you too yeah. have been striving for that level of success and playability. Mm-hmm. And then the odd ones out, like having a bad day, it's cloudy in LA and we're going to write some, you know, lamenting record on what, what you know whatever the subject matter but i think that just kind of proves like the stakes are so high so when you're getting in the room you want to compete with these records mm-hmm. these these uh, like a prayer you yeah, know yeah. you you got to get to that level um or what are we doing this for yeah for our own parents sake like yeah. just so they can hear a record and like tell their friends like it's just not enough yeah. brian Eno was talking about how art is so paintings are when it when a new painting is and I, I I said this on um on on Michael's live today this afternoon um when paint when a painting is released it is in conversation with all the paintings that the viewer has seen before mm-hmm. and part of its statement is in relation to previous work mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. like a conversation and so when Oh, I forget who the painter was. Um, white on white square on white on white or the white square on white uh, the, paper or whatever. Yeah, uh, I know exactly the one. This, uh, is, this is like just looking at it, it's like, okay. But in context at that moment, in conversation to the paintings it's referring to or the mm-hmm. implications there, that is part of the art. And it got me thinking about music and how like when... Somebody like Diplo drops a record. I feel that 
in his stylistic choices, I feel that conversation to previous work, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that social context and relevance. Um, and to me, that that is an aspect of its artfulness, mm-hmm. is the social awareness and the consideration of the listener and that layer that's encoded in there, which is mm-hmm. relative to other previous work, his own work or, or, or his other popular records. And, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is a, a thing that like, you know, working DJs pick this up because they're in direct relationship to audiences as they mm-hmm. drop records. And so they're part of that audience, right? Um, uh, and, you know, if we're thinking about other top 40 records, like a lot of the ones that come across your desks, is they're borrowing stylistic choices mm-hmm. of other people. And so what is that then? Those are like studies on another person's work, mm-hmm. um, but not necessarily a statement or... Um, and I don't think that it could have other layers of art in it, artfulness. Um, the lyric could be incredible. Mm-hmm. You know, there could be real poetry there. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't know. Like the, the, <laughs> this is interesting for it to be a study. Um, people would have had to have studied like a lot of people are doing it without knowing their reference points and not participating in the conversation. So that's all I'm hearing when you're saying that mm. is a lot of people haven't done you the work. St- you're saying buying a splice pack is not doing the study? <laughs> that's what I'm just, saying. But that's what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> who knows if they understand, if people, if I understand the reference point, I mean, my job is kind of to understand the reference point. I'm, mm. I'm, I'm old enough and studied enough in a lot of decades of music that I guess that's part of my, my, my role mm. and why I would get hired. But, mm. um, I can't imagine everybody recognizes every layer that they're trying to encode in this record. No, I don't think they can. I don't think they can. Yeah. And that's, but yeah. that's a sign of the context of, of the time today, which mm. we've talked about in previous episodes. So a lot of this is still like really circular in our, in our, like, I'm wondering what our actual beef is, you know? Like oh where, yeah. You know, I don't, like, I don't know. I mean, I, I, there's clearly beef and I'm sharing in it all with yeah. you, but I'm still like three episodes, four episodes in, I still don't actually know what the oh, beef that's, is. Oh, that's that's to me is a different. That's different to this design versus art thing. Agreed. Yeah, but the the lack of understanding of why or how art would be encoded in pop popular music hmm. um, is that same thing hmm. Hmm. Um, because it's hmm. it's a it's a it's a replication. It's a it's a print of another thing. Cause my, you know, I'll say, I'll say something if Graham's over while I'm um, mixing a song or if someone else is over, I'd be like, this is cool, but I'd rather listen to X, like the right. record it's actually mimicking. Yeah. Like, I'm going to put the police on. Why would I listen to this version of yeah. it? Yeah. It hasn't, it hasn't taken the police innovated to another, it hasn't innovated it. upon yeah. the, the existing records. I'm going to put, you know, I'll put a Prince record on because it's just not as good as that, <laughs> but it's tight. It's cool. And maybe we'll educate a new generation on Prince music and then they'll discover Prince by on Spotify. It'll say also sounds like, and <laughs> yeah. it's like, Oh, who's this guy? And then yeah. it's like mind blowing music for yeah. another generation. I think there's yeah. positives to sure. replication. Sure, yeah. um, but I still like, I, I know that between what we're the two subject subjects we're discussing now, that yeah. there's, there's an underlying beef and I don't know what I don't it think is. There, I don't think there is. There is. Okay. And, Cause I actually okay. think we're, we're, and this is what, you know, I, I went into, when I first brought this up, I went into it with the sort of baseline assumption is that, and, and it's what has been like my sort of primary interest in why I'm looking at architecture, why I'm looking at all these things is it's about community cohesion and what are the learnings from various art forms and how they can empower us and others to form meaningful communities. Like what are the things that help? And I was thinking, like, if you, if we were like, it's time to do conversations meetups again, except this time we're going to do it in an alley in Skid Row and we're ordering Jack in a Box. Like, would people be motivated to participate in that com- community? Mm-hmm. Right? I, I, when there's an obvious answer there. It's not how I'm, I'm, what we would do as event planners mm-hmm. and, and people as com- community organizers. Yeah. Like, we would... You know, we would set the stage for something good. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the role, the thing about traditional music is like, well, wow, there's like this powerful human connection thing here. Um, what does that say about art and culture in general um, when 
trying to um, bring a community together and um, create a, a community that sustains and um, even institutions within that community that help to shape young people who are coming in to the field of audio engineering or professional audio in this case. Mm -hmm. And also, what does that mean for other? So what are, what are the things that you can use? Like, um, who was it? That, um, somebody was talking today about, somebody joined the army back in whatever, 40 years ago, and they never went to war. But what they did do is march with other people Mm -hmm. all day mm -hmm. like the cord the physical coordination mm -hmm. with other people and i've experienced really profound human connection like elation e e like like some one of the most powerful sensations that i had of feeling like part of a group was at um an indian wedding where there was this sort of ritualistic dance um, that took place. Not really a dance. It's more like a line dance thing with two lines of people, maybe 20 on each side facing each other, holding sticks. This is like a Gujarati mm -hmm. tradition thing. Um, the night of the Mendy party where every, everyone gets decorated. The bride gets her hands decorated with um, Mendy. And... Um, and what you do is you look in the person across from you, you look them in the eyes and you click sticks mm -hmm. and then you take a step back and everyone steps to the left. So the person in front of you is going right and you're going left. And now you have a new person to look at. You cross sticks, you click and everyone makes eye contact with everyone, acknowledges everyone. And like, I'm not a, I'm not a joiner. Like mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't participate in these group line dancing. Like this is just not what I do. <laughs> And to be suddenly, like, the look, I was in tears. Like, the look on everyone's faces, I was like, how have I not known this is a thing? That, like, a sensation of groupness is a really powerful emotion. Like, why have mm. I, this is something I've been cut off from and I've hidden myself away from, mm. like, since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Another time that I felt this was, like, with you, John, when we went, um, Nancy Silverton's restaurant, um, Chispaco, Chispaco. Mm -hmm. And then we went to see Sam Harris with yeah. um, Steven Pinker. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we walked into the Kodak theater full of thousands of <laughs> Sam Harris listeners, it was like, Jesus mm -hmm. Christ, what is this feeling yeah, a big night. of like, like-mindedness, like this sort of calm and elation that comes from being in the presence of like-minded people. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think about what what are what are what are all the things? What are the constituents of community? Like what are the things that hold community together? Share beliefs, share, you know, common values and but beyond that, what is like the cultural um you know, symbolic stuff, symbols, um words and phrases, you know, I'm hip to all that. Um, you do that with a band, right? You've got album titles, you've got these words and terms all over everybody's t-shirts and it's like sort of shared view. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in churches, like live music performance, I mean, some of the, I mean, I didn't have a great time at church and with the whole thing, but when you've got, you know, a, a few hundred strangers, you know, other, uh, so... Around Christmas time, when I was a kid, it was it was a tradition for various congregations to get together on a Sunday night and turn off all the lights, light candles. Mm -hmm. Everybody's holding candles and just sing a cappella. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, there's just nothing like it, mm -hmm. you know, um, to participate in that. And <laughs> I had these fantasies of like, you know, I keep thinking about the Bauhaus of audio and like what we would do with the, you know, a group of young people and. I was like, yep, we need audio engineer, choir. Mm -hmm. We need them in the room, mm -hmm. belting. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You don't want audio engineers. Want these, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but no, we do. You're right. You no, I, mean? I, know what you I watched a video on Reddit this week, just scanning late. And it's like, you know, Polynesian girl getting married um, and her husband is not at all Polynesian. He looks like me. 
and they do the the bridal party does some traditional you know I'm doing it a disservice but a traditional Polynesian war dance hmm. not a not a happy dance like a, a really intense so if you've seen the the haka that the that the is that um, the equivalent of like if you fuck with my daughter, I'll fucking kill you kind it, of thing. It was, there was maybe 30 guys. It looked like a mix of people who looked like us who were showing up, who had learned the dance and obviously Polynesian dudes and had it on the AirPods and I start watching it. And this is like, oh, this is just another one of these videos. Mm. By the end, I was tears streaming down mm. my face. Mm. It was incredibly powerful. Mm. And the bride is crying and the husband like the the conviction with which everyone sang the song and it's very physical. It's really yeah, yeah. really intense. Cool, I yeah. mean, it makes the you've seen the New Zealand rugby players do their hockey. It, it makes that look like yeah. you know lying on the couch watching what? TV. That's really intense. Wild. I didn't know you can get more intense than that. Way <laughs> way more intense. But what was really interesting <laughs> to me it was just like here are thirty people, um, really and and clearly fifteen of them say of the guys were of that tradition mm. that would have been as comfortable as an Irish ballad is for me. Sure. And 15 were you guys who don't know any Irish ballads, mm. who, but who showed up and spent the time to really learn it. And some of them were doing solos. They were leading sections. Mm. Really, really committed. It's, it was a very, like there's this whole thing where they're sticking their tongues out and like waving their tongues. Mm -hmm. And like you could be, you could hold back, you could be, yeah. make fun of it. Yeah. They're all like, really committed mm. and by the end it's just and then every single person puts their forehead against someone else mm. every like like you said they go yeah. to each person they all swap out forehead against forehead and then a big fucking hug mm. and it was just like I'm looking at it going man how sanitized our lives are yeah how, how separate how yeah how sort of we've washed out all of this stuff so it's like well I'll send him a text that's I guess, the thing you know. like we were talking about <laughs> regional like pop you know pop popular music or even accents, right? The mid mid Atlantic act, or no, not the mid Atlantic accent. That's different. Uh, like the uh, like a standard sort of broadcast accent, mm -hmm. non regional accent in the yes. United States. There's a reason, you know. It, it's it's um, inclusive, right? Mm -hmm. um, music, pop music is sort of what do we say last week? Denuded of the sort of regional mm -hmm. elements in a lot of cases. Um, the the regional stuff. Like the depth of that of that thing you're describing of this community of people acknowledging each other and expressing a thing, right, for a purpose, uh, you know, which in a wedding scenario you got to assume it's for the well-being of the couple and mm -hmm. the, you know, expressing the support of the community or whatever whatever that looked like. Um, ultimately, no matter what the literal meaning of the music might be or the mm -hmm. song. Mm -hmm. um, that hasn't been replaced by like a generic universal international tradition. Mm -hmm. It's like we just sort of lose it. Right? Mm -hmm. We lose the flourishes mm -hmm. and the and the articulations that make something specific to a place, but it's not replaced by a, a kind of international version of that. It just it's just gone from it. Mm -hmm. Um in a lot of cases. You know, you think about a pop song that sounds sort of like an Irish ballad. It doesn't have any of the mm -hmm. Irish things about it other than maybe a basic mm -hmm. chord structure or some some thing, some slight some slight aspect. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Very much so. And what does that mean? Like, what does that mean that we don't have we don't have an uh, a universal version of the regional region specific tradition is it even possible i don't know that's what i mean it's yeah. like what is and then if you didn't come up with that if you've never been exposed to it if you're born in this in this world as it is today would you rec like would you even value it do people watch that same video that i watched and are like hmm, cute would it move them the way it moved me? Maybe not on video, but if you're there and people you yeah, love are participating, I, I would hope so. I would so. be like, how does yeah. your body not respond? I would hope so, How does yeah. the cynicism hold up? <laughs> yeah. I mean, or if you're even too young to be cynical, like mm. if you're, you know... Yeah, just the naivety. Child, well, yeah. it depends yeah. on if your device is in your hand or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You could, no, you, you could imagine that that Polynesian wedding and a table of 15 people looking like us with their phones in their hands... 
and not connecting the way that you did through the video. You, mm. That's that's without a doubt possible. Mm-hmm. It's because again, that like incentive structures. What's the incentive to be moved by that when you can be moved by a trillion other things through your screen? Like you mm-hmm. could find moving uh, phrases or videos or mm. you, songs, anything uh, and you're, on a dime. And that's really someone who is absent from the mm-hmm. event. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which which is where we're at is what I guess I'm trying yeah. to bring up that I feel like every more people are absent than than present most of the time, like which is why like, mindfulness <laughs> is becoming such a trend now. You know, for yeah, lack of better right. words, right? Like right. the the desire to be mindful and to be present. That word is like, why does that even have to be? <laughs> <laughs> you know, a trend like it should yeah. just be. Yeah, uh, what's making us unmindful? It's a noisy world. It's what's a noisy world. Unmindful. Yeah. yeah, and and for better and for worse. I mean, there's there's a lot of cool shit to take in. Like, there's nothing wrong with taking in I and mean, being up late on Reddit, like you just said, you were and found this thing. But what's the difference between being present at this wedding or at a family event or at a community gathering that maybe isn't obviously presented to you as community because maybe you don't fit into your community like you did when you yeah. were younger, yeah. like I did when I was younger yeah. and wanted to get out of the wedding as soon as possible. And now yeah. I think back to all the Greek weddings I went to and didn't participate in the dances you're talking about yeah. on the Indian front. Yeah. Um, I I should have, mm. you know. I can now see their value, right? Yeah, right. After the fact, um, well, that that ties yeah. to. Something and I was I, just hating the time and finding more souvlaki to eat because yeah. I was a fat kid and just love fucking souvlaki. <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to sort of acknowledge earlier when you when you described your live sound experience, you know, being being young, see the cover band, please the audience, the whole audience goes nuts, sweet Caroline, everyone's drunk, it's great, and then the cool band with the original songs comes on and most people leave or, you know, they don't, it doesn't connect. And we're, you know, all drawn to it. It's a very adolescent thing to Mm. want to identify with the outsiders, with the, to, to, to say that we're different. It's kind of an adolescent move to sort of separate yourself from the group. Coping mechanism. You know, Mm. yeah. And it's, it's just a way of, of, well, like if this is the group, I am other. I'm, it's a self othering to, in, in a, in pursuit of your own identity. But, you know, I think, you know, that may have been, that may have been when you were in the village and you would say, well, I'm going to go and and kill the lion and and you go out and you come back three days later, dirty and tired and there's no lion and everyone's like, hey, what's up? You, you failed too? All right, get back in the village, bake some fucking bread. Mm -hmm. Um, But now we go out into the world and it's just this endless supply of, of sort of indulgence of this adolescence um, impulse um, you can you can be an adolescent all the way to the end if you want. There's there's no mm. end of of self indulgent bullshit to get caught up in uh, mm. ideology or or consumerism or mm-hmm. you know um, whatever. So where where that mode I think is is important because we were all in that mode. Like I've uh, we've, I've done the same thing. Been been to weddings and. And you're kind of like I'm not. I'm not this. I'm. I'm too cool for this. I'm outside this. I'm yeah. Not, and what does you know. that even mean? Yeah. Exactly. It means what, nothing. What does it mean? Um. So, yeah. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I don't think I don't think we have a beef. I just think I had an immature. I, like, I like immature beef, idea. man. I like beef. Let's yeah, get well, into the beef. Well, I, I think I had a, an Im- immature, ill-formed way of describing an experience mm-hmm. um, without the context in which it means anything to me, which is this, like, looking at everything that could affect, positively affect community depth and meaning. Um, and, you know, it it's getting everybody together. Like, if we knew music had some kind of value in this project, in this mission, then making a point to prioritize getting in the room with real musicians and no PA. Do you know what I'm saying? Like yes. a real intimate connection to like, we're in Los Angeles, man. There's some motherfuckers here. Yeah. Like we can get in the room. There's some adolescent motherfuckers here. <laughs> <laughs> There's some real players, like some real, you know, and, um, you know, how we got the room how, too. Well, yeah. I mean, how will that help? You know, how, like when, um, when your brother was here, John, and we put on comedy show mm-hmm. up here in the loft, like obviously a PA helps with comedy. It's part of the mm-hmm. part of the thing, right? But 
um, it actually enhances the thing. It doesn't take away from it the way it does with music. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the knowing that there's a calendar and a program of these sort of collective events um, to me seems like an essential aspect of keeping a community going. Mm -hmm. um, gatherings that are enjoyable, that involve music and rhythm and coordination and syncopation. I mean, I think like recreation is a big piece of this too. Like keep thinking about Rory's hiking club, you know, like once a month there's a, there's a walk up the mountain in Altadena with Rory. And of course it'll be a cool discussion and there can be a number of people going up, mm -hmm. up and down the mountain. And, and that's one of the things we do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the yeah. cycling thing I want to do, like, there could be multiple versions of it, but to synchronize efforts in other ways. This is where Rory with Sydney, I didn't really, I wasn't really able to put into words why I was so hot on team sports for kids. Mm -hmm. And it and it has to do with this like synchronized efforts. Yeah. And yeah. and the common goals and all the stuff you can't really do otherwise as kids. I, I used to think uh, we've talked about this in earlier episodes, but you know, the getting made fun of from the musicians and the theater crew when I was in theater and also from the sports kids for being in music and not being sporty enough. It's like, I thought it was why well, I chose music because I'm cool and athletes aren't cool. It's like, wait, I learned so much more from my time on sports teams mm. on how to collaborate than I ever did solo practicing my instrument right. in the practice room, which yeah. is what professors in music school tell you to do. Get in there and practice for eight hours a day by yourself. Huh. It's like, wait, what? I'm trying to be in the jazz band and improv. Like, what are you talking <laughs> to go to the room and practice by yourself? It's just mm. not the way to go. Mm. But sports teams, you're disciplined. You're doing things together. One of you is tired. The other one pulls you along. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, mm. yeah, I can't think about more of a proper learning experience communally and mm. um, collaboratively than the sports experiences that I've had. Mm. You know, it's like, just, I mean, I didn't go to the army, right? It's, it's another version <laughs> yeah. of, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Thank God. Yeah. I wanted to ask you guys about the live today because I got, I, I had a ton to do. Yeah. So I was, while I was, and we went on for like six hours. Printing so stuff. It was it was long. I got to log go. on while I was printing things, like while there was stuff rendering. I could log on and catch 10 minutes and then Michael I had to turn had, um, on the uh, Prime Now deliver a notebook while we were there because he ran out of pages. <laughs> yes. He just I, kept going I, I, I onto did. the table. He was just like, fuck. It was a lot, but it seemed like it was, it seemed like it was productive. Was there, was there anything? I mean, obviously anyone who's in our orbit it's probably checking it out anyway, but was there anything of, of note to bring to this table, Michael, do you think, or a lot or? I mean, there, there's a lot. Yeah. Um, luckily after the call, I highlighted, uh, some key points because I need to add this to the mind map and whatnot. But, um, I mean, overall, just to summarize, like we covered three topics, play, history, language, and, um, Self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Self-esteem, yeah. I think the self-esteem riff was really cool. Um, yeah. I mean, so those were kind of the the main topics, and then, you know, so many subtopics emerged from that. But, um, yeah, I think the self-esteem one was interesting. Um, kind of looking at these notes here. Uh I mean, this was pure thinking out loud. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really... relation to hierarchies mm. um, and how self-esteem is a downstream effect. Uh, not it's a, point a reflection of point. Intervention. Not an intervention point, yeah. yeah. Um, the myth of positive psychology and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, how people place and practice, so context shapes psychology more than saying this is great <laughs> um and uh then uh oh yeah we ended on silver lining versus silver lying <laughs> oh yeah um yeah i mean that was an interesting riff I, I don't know i mean i haven't really had time to like integrate any of it in my head just like sure. highlight it and say idea cool Good point. Yeah, yeah point, I was in it. Know. It's hard for me to recall. What is silver lying? Well, that's it was <laughs> a free flow. Give it to us. <laughs> so the, the 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 idea was 
lying to yourself, like the posit- sort of the positive affirmation thing, like looking in the mirror and telling yourself you're great and that you feel mm-hmm. great and mm-hmm. this sort of thing is kind of lying to yourself. It actually has a negative effect, um, mm-hmm. not the effect people intend. Mm-hmm. Um, the, but at the same time, leaning in, looking for silver linings, like those two aren't the same thing, but they can sort of look the same. Like if mm-hmm. you're in a situation and you're like looking for the upside in a bad situation, you can do that without lying to yourself about mm-hmm. the gravity of what's going on. Mm-hmm. And it was just kind of an interesting thing to to point out. I, I can give a real a real time version of that. Yesterday was yeah. I've been nauseous for a few days, mm. um, and I could look in the mirror and be like, "I'm not nauseous. I'll get over this. It'll be fine." Versus well, what can I adjust um, to fix my nausea so I can be great again? Yeah. Instead of telling myself that I feel great. When someone asks how you're feeling, I'm, eh, I'm not feeling that good. I'm nauseous. Oh, I feel great. And you're lying. So that's a silver lying. Well, would I, be, I don't well, know what because the I silver can, has no, 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 to do no, with beca- it. I, no, I, I, get, yeah. I get it. Because <laughs> you, you can be distracting yourself yeah. to get through a thing to tell yourself that you're going to be okay. Yeah. Versus straight up saying I'm fucking great when you're yeah. dying inside and yeah. you're not asking for help. Yeah. Yeah. I Yeah. I, like I mean, that. Just, I like there that. was, I was maybe grasping at like silver tongue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's like good lying and mm-hmm. silver lining. I don't know. I was looking yeah. for a. There's something there. There's something there. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I remembered a Radio Lab episode that I had heard years ago and I just found it quickly. And it was one of the. It's all about lying to yourself. It's a whole. Did you guys ever go deep on Radio Lab? Was that a I thing? Did. I did back yeah. in the day. Back yeah, it was yeah. really. I mean, yeah. 12, 14 years ago, it was really. Wow. For me, it was really. I used to get them on CD um, mm, from, Jesus. Well, from I didn't a friend. Go back that he, far, would, but he would, mm. uh, would burn well, them on a... It had to have been it had to have been 12 or 13 years ago because of it was in the house in Ireland. So mm-hmm. it was, you know. But anyway, this particular episode I remembered and it was about lying to yourselves, uh, different themes. But one of the guests, psychologist Joanna Starek, tells us that swimmers who lie to themselves swim faster than those who do not. Yeah. And they were, they were looking at, at studies about how uh, hyper successful people are, are often sort of self deluded de- deluded yeah, yeah. but and use it as a as a kind yeah. of a springboard yeah. so it's kind of but they're they're a sort of an edge case i think yeah. you know uh, in, applying that day to day is just that's just regular delusion <laughs> rather than a, olympic Performance, olympic yeah. delusion <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. yeah i'm not tired <laughs> but I'm tired it's mm-hmm. not going to saying you're, admitting you're tired is not going to get you into the race like yeah, yeah, yeah i guess yeah. that that's a different performance it's, it's, aspect. I think yeah. it's a, it's a technique for knocking down artificial barriers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, I think like me being a teenager, 14-year-old kid being like, I'm going to get a record deal. Like mm-hmm. I can earn international attention and, and get the money investment that mm-hmm. everyone else in the world wants. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm going to do that. It's pretty diluted. Um, at the same time, it's like... Um, it's it. Let me put it this way: It wasn't probable, um, yes. Given where I come from, but it had happened in the past. It was it, yeah. there was prior. Yeah, there are other examples. examples of, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, so it wasn't entirely, you know. Yeah. Um, but if I were being practical and reasonable, um, I just sort of had to had to believe. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, I mean, I think there are other ways of knocking down the sort of artificial limitations that we don't even realize are there most of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, interesting. Phelps, I'm the best. Mm-hmm. Like I can just, <laughs> I'm just, what I'm is coming that at self-talk it. Like, I'm just you know? coming at it the complete opposite way. I've never been able to do it because I can't take myself seriously. I'm gonna break the record. Right but maybe now. I'd be better or further along or want a podcast. You know, if uh, if I thought that way, I was like, oh, I could do this. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is great. Well, this you is just, easy. You just need a competitor, and then you can't help yourself. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> that it kicks in a muscle well, that you do have. You know? Yeah. Luckily, <laughs> there's like 10 million podcasts. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Compete with any of them. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Did, uh, did we look at actually how many podcasts there are? Because I, I think that two million point. number isn't real. Let's you see. think it's higher or lower? Like having one episode from like thirteen years mm. ago, like this that not, count? It's right, not, right, like, right. It's active, not like yeah. What about active the, podcasts? Yeah. You know, Curious. like I think if there are more than four episodes, it's only like eight hundred thousand. And if you start upping, yeah, eight hundred fifty thousand. 
Yeah, and you start upping the standards, like there's actually a much smaller number mm. of relevant podcasts. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, there's lots Close of Close to a million is. is pretty serious. That's pretty serious. Yeah. Well, what's so John, another one? Just choose one of those. Yeah, I mean, a lot of movies have been made. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Did you t- did you talk about any of the, any of this in the in the live? Is there anything about competition that fits into that kind of positive psychology affirmation hmm. where where competition? Um, I don't know. Is is there any hmm. daylight there? Like, is there something that like is that just another psychological drive for people that? It takes two. It's not one isn't good enough. Like I, yeah, I can't, you need a nemesis. Yeah, I can't really yeah. um, mm. motivate myself. But if but but I can. Like I don't I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's in relation to another. The Beatles and the and Brian Wilson would have always talked about hearing each other's records and wanting to being inspired yeah. by deeply inspired, but also yeah. wanting to one up. That's how. Yeah, that's yeah, how I. That's know. how I feel about my my peers. Is like I don't want them not to get the gig, but I also want the gig. That's mm-hmm. how I always put it at the conversation nights. Like I'm not trying to steal anybody's gig, but at the same time, like oh man, I think I could have done better. And yeah, you have a vision for what it could be. Would be yeah, 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 and you wanna and you wanna see it. Actually, I think enacted. competitions it feels easy. healthy. That yeah. seems like a useful thing to parse a bit since. Yeah, it's such a powerful aspect of John's thing. Yeah, and the, and the dark side of it, of course, is that people beat themselves up that often they think they're in races that they're not in. Sure. Um, you know, or mm-hmm. or you know, competition th- at at all costs or zero sum framework mm-hmm. or yeah. Mm-hmm. That yeah. seems like something we could use a pro to talk, like someone who had. Can we get Thug Rose? Who's that? Rose. Um, she just won an- another title. Um, on UFC. Apparently, it's a really dramatic story, and I didn't get the details, but she's she's kind of a charismatic young yeah, I feel lo- fighter and and but if you like you see the footage of her and her opponent after the fight, it's just beautiful, man mm-hmm. just the love and appreciation, the honor and respect it's just um two women giddy about how they just fucked each other up, yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean like it's really powerful um. That's how I feel when you and I debate art versus design. <laughs> it's kind, we yeah. just hug at the end and eat a steak. You know, kind it's kind of. I mean, I was thinking. I was thinking about this too. Like the Julia Galef's new book. She was just on Coleman today. Mm. The first clip dropped. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I haven't listened to it yet. I'm uh, sure I will. Yeah, there's a ten minute clip up now before the. Oh okay. Before the full thing comes out. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but her new book is called Scout Mindset, and it's it's about this difference, like going into an, a. A conversation as a soldier, you're going to defend your position. You're going to attack someone else's point points. You know, it's like this um, confrontational thing. Whereas a scout mindset, it's more of like a survey. Mm. You're working together to survey um, the landscape, mm. and it, and it's um, it's a very different framework. Um, and I wonder, like, there could even be a competitive aspect within that. Scout collab, scout like collaboration. Mm-hmm. Um, there are different domains of competition. Well, if both have the intention of surveying the landscape and taking the conversation yeah. further, then the competition is to see who can come up with a better or who can change idea. their mind on uh-huh. something fundamental first. Mm. Like who can have their mind <laughs> changed. Interesting. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. On, that's, on, <laughs> that's funny. It sounds but that's opposite. that's the values of of the scout mindset. Mm. On my yeah. theme of the week, you know, you you, you mm. look at. There's a place for for scouts, people who really know what's happening, who mm. who can map the terrain accurately, mm. who can assess what's really going down mm. on their side and on the you know on the opposing team or teams. Mm. Um, but then there there we need visionaries too, people like Elon that we were talking about at dinner, who you know there is someone who knows more about the state of the existing car business than him. There's a yeah, but that, a, that's a, not science and that's not reason. That's rhetoric. Like you well, need that le- le- you need of course rhetoric. But, but, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, v- a vision for what's possible for a possible future even even if there isn't an obvious bridge from where we're at. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um because you know, that's that's an engine for for development in the world. So, mm. um I guess I'm I'm I need to read the book, but I'm just wondering about the limits of the sort of scout scout mindset if you get become too attached to reality and Mm. don't spend enough time thinking about what could be, mm. even if it seems unreasonable, like being on Mars or or building a new car company or, you know, yeah, putting I, I, putting yeah. AI in people's brains. You should you should read it. I haven't, uh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, but it, it's, I think it's maybe still on pre-order or just about to drop, but um, 
There's no reason why a scout can't imagine what's over the horizon. Yes, that's true. You yeah. know, fighting, arguing, debating the position, fighting for something, that's the realm of, of rhetoric and mm. persuasion. Mm -hmm. That's not science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, science is a methodology and you need a certain mindset to so, conduct it. Well, science, yeah, I mean, science is separate again to what I've, what I've gleaned for what she's doing. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, science is, yeah, reason. Yeah, reason. The science yeah. would be un under, the, um, under the umbrella of reason. Yes, yeah, yeah. But if you come yeah. at thing, I mean, if you come at things creatively, only under the guise of reason, how who's right in the room then when you're trying to come up with an idea of oh, I don't, yeah. is the yeah. you know yeah. Well, that's what I'm, th I'm thinking collaboratively. Scout mentality to me is collaborative. It's it's um you know there's 15 of you. There's mm. whatever. Uh, there's a leader. There's a scout leader always. Mm. Um, so do you default to the producer, aka the scout leader in the room for mm. the final say, like? Where does this tie into collaboration? And well, well, you come up with a lyric. Are you going to defend it? Mm -hmm, that's what I mean. Or are you collectively going to try to uncover the exactly. best version? I of think it? that's the that's middle okay. ground between yeah. the two points of view. Is what I'm saying. It's like the the scout mentality coming into is well, nobody's wrong, but how do we uh, together uh, innovate and, yeah. and and elevate? Yeah. And the reality is that on any given conversation with like we think of a young producer, artist, songwriter, engineer, we would advocate any and all of those positions all of the time. Sometimes you need to have a vision for something that there isn't an obvious way to get to. Sometimes you need to be realistic and pragmatic and grounded and, mm -hmm. and map the terrain accurately. Um, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. you do need to defend the song from the artist or from the other co-producer because he's not up to it mm -hmm. and you are and you're going to go and he's not and this song is worth fighting for, you know. Mm -hmm. So in the creative world, it's way less clear, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and we quite often, we're, we're making rules only to turn around and break them moments <laughs> later, you know. But I, I think in the space that she's Yeah, her thing is in, the Center for Applied Rationality, and what they mm -hmm. do is mm -hmm. create these, again, these like in-person teams of people where they, they, they engender this culture of curiosity and learning and and um train really training people to make better decisions yeah you know it's a it's really about how do you approach a decision why should you vote for this person should i do this um right like an actual would, framework yeah if i got to and to know which That's, mindset you're in she find i think yes. her point is that to find it useful to know am i shifting am i in this like political debate and i'm shifting into a soldier mindset because yes. I'm feeling a certain way yeah. and to call yourself out on it and return to, if you, you know, her last pot, her podcast is called, um, Julia Galef's podcast is called Rationally Speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the last episode, what she does is she has a, a conversation with three different people about the Uber and Lyft problem, about the, should people be, um, should the drivers be independent or should they be employees and got three different points of view and mm -hmm. you see the way she conducts the conversation, you'll see the scout mindset on display, mm -hmm. like the mm -hmm. way she's reasoning based off of what the person says, sort of volleying it back, um, steering things, um, but always in this sort of open, leaning in, vulnerable kind of way. Mm -hmm. Um was a decision made in that moment? I don't know. No, I think it was an exploration to try to draw out the um, a, a more complete perspective ra rather than having one guest and getting a point of view. Like you actually hear in the interview that there there are nuances that matter, and, and you know yeah. the statistics can be broken down. Like the drivers, like who's sort of spending the most hours. Um, who's sort of full-time slash part-time in terms of the hours they're spending and who's doing the most rides, like they're not the same. Mm. And so like when you have a statistic, it doesn't mean sort of what it's set, what it, it, set, it, it, it seems to mean. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, I think she, she's a fascinating character who's been, she's been sort of doing this thing since, I don't know, like 15 years or something. Mm -hmm. um, There's some, YouTube clips of hers from like 15 years ago, mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of in the early stages of this thing. Yeah. And, and the book is finally coming out. I don't know. She was 
out of public eye for a while. I'm not sure what was that. But When I think of the music business, I think we need way more rationality and way less rationality. Like, in, in you know, in different domains, it's yeah, like... Economic I rationality. And <laughs> some of it is way too grounded yeah. and some of it is way too... Yeah. Based on religion about gear and yeah. converters and mojo and voodoo and bullshit and, yeah. you know, so... It, uh, Pseudo and, rationality, and, and again, w it it can be confusing to people because we switch modes on that stuff, and it, and it's hard to sort of piece together one. You know, I I was having a um a, a quick uh, IG conversation with um uh, I'm going to screw up his name Gerhard Gerhard Vers Verhalen Verstappen. I anyway um friend of Jesse's. Oh okay. Uh, um, in Calgary, yeah, and it's like we're we're t you know he's got a blog and I'm working and reading the blog and kind of DMing him and and like he's doing a lot of good stuff and I was like oh I see how you're studying here and this mm -hmm. is good and you yeah, know yeah. but it's like there's so much I can't mm. say what I think about DSP in a in a DM mm. you know what I mean yeah, and, yeah. and you know yeah. but he's thinking that it, in a deep way about when to use it when not to use it yeah. what's overusing it how are PMC using it you yeah. know. Uh, why would I use it with a, you know, because that, that we were riffing about a particular room that had passive speakers and DSP. And I was like, that's the worst of both worlds. Yeah. You know, it's <laughs> yeah. like, that's, that's like paying two prices and yeah. no, no win, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. but, um, which is kind of true and not true. You know what I mean? It's just not something you can do in a DM mm. conversation. But, mm. um, so I all have to say that, that it's hard to, I think to a young person, I could be quite perplexing. He's 24 or five. I could be quite perplexing in my apparent sort of moving from the mystical to the, to the, uh -huh. like he, and then he, he says, you know, he didn't, Gerhard wouldn't say this, yeah. but let's say he comes back and says, yeah, borrow converted man, so mojo. And like horseshit, distortion out the window, fucking. Yeah. And then I'll go yeah, back to so obvious talking too. about, um, to talking about something mystical three yeah. minutes later. Sure. And it's like, how do you keep up with that? You mm -hmm. know, there isn't a coherent position. It's kind and of. It's impossible to keep up with unless yeah. you follow uh, someone on the is regular. Is it really that incoherent? It's, it, it's, I mean, ration, like it's rational to consider like this is, this is one of the fallacies that Julia Galef outlined and it's the straw Vulcan. It's related <laughs> to the straw man. Mm. I've never heard of this. Okay. So the straw Vulcan is, it's sort of like the Spock caricature. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's that to be rational is to decouple entirely from emotion, which is a total it's a total falsehood. Mm -hmm. It's to be rational is to integrate with emotion. It's not to decouple mm. or even attempt to. Um, emotions are a, na a natural and <laughs> essential aspect of human existence, and it is rational to recognize it, them and to integrate them. Uh, and so, like, I don't, I don't often see, like, when we talk about magic, oh, we're waiting for the magic. You know, like if your monitoring is not right, the magic might might slip by and you won't notice. Or, you know, mm. we talk about magic and it's shorthand for the indescribable. Mm -hmm. We don't mm -hmm. call it the X factor or like, you know, it's it's just something we don't have words for. Well, yeah, I'm thinking of quite often, you know, someone, if, if a young engineer, producer, songwriter, musician, whatever, asked us for advice, we might give an answer and say, well, our intuition would be to do this. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't necessarily justify it with a, with, sure. with, um, you know, uh, a reasoned or rational or grounded argument. And mm -hmm. um, it's based on experience and mm -hmm. to, to, to someone maybe younger, more naive, it can often be confusing the way we would mode switch in that, in that way. I think I could see that, but um, it is also rational to fall back on an unsubstantiated intuition if there's a track record. Yes, if you have that experience. You see what I mean? yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, yeah. I remember this as as a young engineer sort of hanging around with people with more experience where you're like, you know, you say A and he's like, A is great. And you say B and he's like, B is great. And then you're like, C. And he's like, no, C sucks. And you're like, what? Like, what's going on? <laughs> like, you know, and, and yeah. you get spun around, you yeah. know, trying to, trying to figure it out. Yeah. Um, it's all healthy. I think it's good. Yeah, I'm 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 very comfortable in where we're at with it, but uh, <laughs> I do I do appreciate how it can be confusing to sure to younger people sometimes. 
I'm trying to back out of my five years practice of rationality and find a little bit more of the magic, being more open to the magic. Mm -hmm. How does rationality close you off to the magic? I don't know. I'm listening to you talk about it. It shouldn't. Um, I don't actually know. I haven't. Um, Brian Eno has a a dimension of, of... experience that he he called control on one side and surrender on the other Mm. um and surrender like this is the like when i'm playing with your kids rory Mm -hmm. i surrender to their desires what makes them laugh yes i just give in yeah and just go with the flow yes for lack of well yeah that's kind of what i'm thinking it's like it's more of acceptance just that Mm. isn't you can't control people people's irrationalities mm. you can choose to go deeper into certain subject matter and conversations with certain people that you might find a um a similar like-minded rationale to have certain types of discussions with mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. You can engage with anybody i'm just thinking like in the, i'm being trying to be careful here just like there's a lot of irrational in our in our business but it doesn't mean i don't want to work with irrational people sure mm-hmm. um, yeah, yeah yeah you know and uh just understanding that about myself that I have, I get anxiety and adverse effects from irrationality mm-hmm. um, in, in email form, in physical mm-hmm. form, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. But it's not, it's how I choose to react to it, which is the, mm. the, the surrender that we're talking about. It's mm. like, and being more, I used to be more malleable and flexible just in general as a human. I think now I've kind of developed a bit of a, um, a harder shell mm. um, for whatever reason, just just studying and listening to people talk about what we're talking about right now mm. has developed a bit of that shell. Um, I'd like a little bit more of it. Mm. Get back. I mean, that's that's what I was hinting at earlier. If I if I was to line up the ten most amazing people I've ever worked with in any of my disciplines that I've done over the years, spent time in the room with, mm-hmm. and the ten most frustrating clients, like they would all be equally irrational. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, you know that some of the most amazing people i've worked with are wildly irrational yeah, what other people, people do but I, but, but i think but mm-hmm. i think i think engineers speaking to the to the listenership mm. could um would behoove them to be a little bit more patient with artists and producers oh, yeah. irrationalities oh, yeah. and not it's to be, rational and not, to, be yeah. impa- to be patient with yes, artists yeah. yes and yes. not stand up and be like it's got to be done this way. It's like, well, it's not going to be done the way yeah. you want it to be done or else you're out the room. You're not getting hired again. Yeah. Learn the other language. And We're it's supposed like, to be bilingual, yeah. Yeah, well, exactly. We're supposed to be bilingual. That's mm-hmm. exactly what I was going to say. Mm-hmm. Um, I I still want to write the book on that. It's just like how to speak like an artist is such a course that doesn't exist in audio school. It's just like we have to learn how to understand and speak outside of our realm as engineers. Yeah. The engineer conversation and dialogue should never even happen in a creative conversation in a session Mm. it should never be brought up it's what exists in the background so the creativity can flow i don't understand why people are talking about engineering in a room with an artist it just never under i never got it (laughs) and i hear all the time and i my engineer homies come complain to me about things that happen in the room and i'm like yes complain to me about it <laughs> just, that's why we had these nights up here that's why we started mm. conversations where we can have a, a community where engineers can vent about the troubled sessions that they have so i can go that doesn't sound bad at all actually yeah. it sounds really normal and i think you you were wrong and yeah. tell people where they were wrong because that's normal yeah. and the irrational is normal i know that's contradictory but that's the way that we're going to get great art as Rory just brought up. That's just the way it is because people are shooting for the moon or Mars or Uranus for that matter. (laughs) And they're high in trait openness. Yeah. Yes. And I'd like to come a little bit backwards personally speaking. I think COVID got me really like, um, got me tight, like alone in the studio, a couple people Mm. around and like Mm. not very collaborative. And Mm. I don't, I don't think I exude that, um, at all, to be honest, I think I'm really good at uh, communicating collaboratively and, and people have said so, so I'll take their word for it. Mm-hmm. But when, going back into the room, which I think in two weeks from now, I start kind of my journey back into the recording. If Ooh. all goes to plan with two artists, two back-to-back weeks, I know. like I better be okay with the rationality that I know that people are about to go you, in you, with. You, you, the, foamy good, bit, man. the foamy bit goes towards the singer. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, and the hard it's bit so down hard here, yeah, away, away from the singer. <laughs> yeah. Just, just hit me up if you need. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll text you. <laughs> yeah. I, you. You did it more recently than me. I haven't recorded I, in so long. This, I'm like, yeah. I have zero nerves about it. No. I have, um, 
I don't have, I have equally a lack of excitement for it. Like I don't, I'm just very um, in the middle, uh, very neutral on mm -hmm. this experience, um, to be honest, mm -hmm. which I think is probably a good place to be. I'm just picturing you in an airport on the, on the conveyor belt, the assisted walking thing in the airport, <laughs> just like moving toward these sessions, just, yeah, just fucking floating. I was thinking about, um, I was thinking about, uh, because I have to go work in other studios. Um, if it gets confirmed, and I'll know this week, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you guys about this, but, um, what studios have, they just, most of them have such bad, um, mm. uh, computers with, um, no plugins you actually use, mm. um, and having what the connectivity is to just like have a second computer. You just show up and like plug mm. in like one cable, like into, a, into a Cat the, Six yeah, cable yeah. or something. What kind of just, room do you need? I wonder if Interscope is gonna. I don't know. We're actually uh, on that. We could talk off off yeah. mic about uh, about mm -hmm. that, but yeah. actually having a separate recording rig might be a good for someone like me. That's just like I these are so. two worlds, and I haven't thought about it till this morning. Mm. It happened during my meditation. I was like, oh wow, light bulb! I should probably get a Mac a Mini channel Aurora, and yeah, and just have a my own. Like Stu White would show up for Beyonce sessions in any studio, yeah. and he had his own. It just plugged into the monitor controller, and that was it. Mm -hmm. um, While we're on the theme of recording, I think we should do a a little tribute to Al, who passed yeah, yesterday. Please, yeah, please, yeah. yes. Um, just a a giant, mm -hmm. I think, in the in the industry, and I've been um, criticized for how vocal I am at at maybe not sharing the the common perception of giants. Al was a giant. Yeah. Um, I was talking to Gerhard again on the, on the thread yesterday about the value of being in LA and I was talking with another friend, uh, Dave Cooley today, a, mm -hmm. a great mastering engineer and um, about the value of being in LA and getting to spend any time with Al is, was, you know, one of those high points of being in LA and um, watching him work, watching him move, you know, the stuff he, he, thought about and talked about the way he carried himself and mm. um, the arc of his life mm. uh, how he collaborated and um, how he spoke to young people you know um, I didn't spend anywhere near as much time with him as like Maurice has and other people and sure. obviously friends of ours Steve Jenowick you know is his right hand man for for decades now and and has you know only so, so much good stuff to say about it Al but um, the one story I wanted to tell, just a, a short one about his character was we were doing, I don't know, I want to say, well, I know actually because um, Ellie wasn't home. So it was probably eight years ago now, seven years ago, we were putting, at the time I was working with PMC and we were putting in the new monitors in A. So if anyone's seen a picture of capital A, the big QB1 you know, four drivers, four base drivers per side, those monitors, they're way up high mm -hmm. in the wall. Uh, that was quite a project to get them into the wall. And, and there was a lot, there was a lot to it, a lot that should have happened that didn't happen and very crunched timelines. But anyhow, I'm, I was doing that um, with some of the text there and we had, we had a deadline to get them in because there was a session, I think the next day. And I was, my two nephews from Ireland, Keelan and Coram, were in town and they were on a kind of work experience. They had taken their school work experience, flown out and were doing it with me. So they were working in the studio, mastering with me and coming around on a lot of the PMC gigs. So they're in the studio with me and we're, we're in the studio. There's photos of me like up in the soffit, soldering, <laughs> soldering the cables for the QB1. Um, but we're in the control room. I think I'm down on the ground at this point. Maybe I'm up in a ladder and the guys are passing me cables and connectors and soldering irons and whatever. And Al comes in and uh, just sort of wanders in to A, you know, and, and he's like, hey guys, what's up? You know, hey, Rory, who are these guys? You know, and it's like, oh, this is Keelan Cora, my nephews. And he's just like, you know, handshakes and get, get talking to them. And, and they're like, what do you do, Al? You know, he's like, oh, I, you know, I make records. And uh, he's like, I'm working next door. And, and they're like, who, who are you working with? He's like, oh, Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> so immediately the guys are just like, you know, oh. spun around. Um, he mm. spent five or 10 minutes talking with them and, and, uh, and really sweet, just gave them great time. But um, 
the next day. So we're in capital for days doing this thing. And the guys are coming and going and getting lunch for me. And, you know, they're going up to the tech shop. Hey, go up and get two more speak-ons and ask for another whatever thing of flux. And they were, do they were working with me. And, uh, and they came back in and they were super high and they had met Al in the, in the hallway and he'd recognized them, tagged back to the conversation yesterday. You know, how's whatever, what's going on with this? You know, is it, how's the thing going? And, and the guys just felt like mm. superstars, mm. you know, this Bob Dylan level recording engineer. I had filled him in after like who, all the people he'd work with and, mm. you know, how, how important he was. But the fact that he had the next day made sure that they got more time and that they, he recognized them and, you know, they're just kids in a big studio, like LA for the first time, you know, uh, you know, it was just so yeah. telling of, of where he was at, you know, yeah. and, and, uh, and how he rolls. And there was just, everyone has stories like that about him. Mm. Um, and, and the other thing I think that's important to say, cause, um, Spider and, and Kyle and I were, yet, were together yesterday and it's, you know, I'm, I recognize the talent of a lot of the legends, you know, and we don't need to, to name people. I recognize that the work they did was important, but a lot of them didn't sustain. Al was making records up until he died. I mean, he was recording, you know, COVID obviously put a damper on things, but he was recording and mixing. And not only that, his records are not throwback records. If you listen to our record, like he worked on that Melody Gardot stuff. Oh, wow. If you if you listen to that, that's not a no. that's not a retro sounding record. No. That's just a, like you described it best, you were saying, these are just truly timeless capturings of, of musical events. And, and it wasn't this one guy who was in, you know, had tricks from a given season and then, you know, they went out of favor and yeah, then they came a back in. set of tools or yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was truly master level Human. recording. And, you know, something that, mm a lot of people are incredulous about, you know, people would say, I've heard Oz records and they say he doesn't use EQ on the board and all that. Like I've watched him mix and I've looked at all the EQs on the board and I've looked at all the faders. I've sat at his shoulder while he mixed Paul McCartney and it's all true. <laughs> Everything that they say, it really is all done in the recording. It was all mic technique. It was great players, great rooms, mm -hmm. you know, um, and just consistently knocking it out. I mean, all of those records you know, do I love late Paul McCartney? Not that much. Mm -hmm. um, but that record represents what happened in the room, like really, really, really well. Mm. Um, and that was his job. And he did it and, uh, and did it, you know, I don't know, can't say enough good things about him. Um, so I just wanted to, to put a tribute on record. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. I have a, um, Al, Al plays a, <laughs> there was a documentary made about a session Al and Steve um, did with um, Chris Walden mm -hmm. arranging. It might have been Big Fat Band. Yes. Um, so my father is a trumpet player and um, up until COVID was like in three big bands. I may have mentioned it before, but um, it was at a time, this was when, this is only three years ago, I think, I started, when I started working with PMC, you know, we were spending a lot more time at Capitol. Um, and, and then, of course, Noah S Snyder started working there a bunch and see mixing movies. And um, so I was spending more time at Capitol and it was like, oh, dad, I think, you know, because my dad follows some trumpet players and players and, that are in big fat band and, and whatever. And I was like, oh, it's like my dad's world. Uh, from the trumpet forums mm -hmm. and my world and my work sort of meeting. I'm like, let me get this documentary. And my dad invited his brother, my uncle Glenn, and a couple of my cousins came over and we all watched this recording session um, with Al doing his thing and Steve doing his thing mm -hmm. and, and, and Chris. And um, they sort of indulged me pausing every f <laughs> five minutes to like, add some commentary to like in some color to like it was really just color commentary what mm -hmm. was going on mm -hmm. giving some more depth to it and whatever and it was like this really tremendous bonding experience mm. for all of us um for my family and so al has always represented this sort of object of our admiration and mm -hmm. and and our sort of the me the meeting of the minds that my father and i do have about music mm -hmm. um and what we like what we enjoy about music um 
and our and our shared you know our sh- the the shared aspect of it you you just changed my neutral to excitement about getting in the room yeah because records just aren't captured right right now no they're not um, and in, in very few people actually know how to do it it's a travesty. I hope i can remember how to do it you yeah you okay. haven't forgotten no nah. <laughs> you're better at it now trust me yeah i feel you yeah yeah it's changed everything yeah i think the last time i the last time i saw al i was in c with um noah and he was just al was just doing the rounds mm-hmm. saying hey <laughs> yeah doing that village thing mm-hmm you know, when I think about your cousins from Ireland, they came to the, you know, not the studio, the village, but the village that it is at, mm-hmm. at Capitol. You know, mm-hmm. it's a number of people there. Yeah. Um, how many rooms were at Capitol? And how well, welcome they were. Seven? I don't There's E. There, uh, there's, there's it's a lot. A, there's a, a, B, and C on the, on the ground floor. And then there was, there was two mastering rooms downstairs and two upstairs. Mm-hmm. And then there was like three or four production rooms. Some of the mastering rooms have been turned into production rooms now. So at most room upstairs. nine or 11. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bunch. Um, yeah. and, and, um, yeah, I thought the, I reposted the Don Waz tribute. I thought that was really, yeah, really, yeah, was um, just captured, captured it really well from someone who knew him and, yeah. and, and knew what it meant to a musician, you know, the whole, the totality of being recorded and respected mm. and honored mm. and heard and and uh, cajoled and made laugh that sort of the the mm. the the real power of engineering not not grinding you down with some fucking technical detail but the the, y- uh, the whole sleight of hand trick is to make that stuff disappear mm-hmm. and and make the artist feel enabled and empowered and emboldened and just mm. just have fun mm-hmm. You know, and when you when you talk about the way Al carried himself, I mean that's the thing. Every time I met I, I met and talked to Al, it was like, oh, this like this vibe. I don't want to say this aura that followed him around was one of optimism mm-hmm. and play mm-hmm. and friendliness and acceptance, and it's just exactly the tone you want in a studio. Yes, when you want to be productive. <laughs> Uh huh. You know, it's just that sort of that's it's an aspect that John um, displays as well as sort of this forward motion, this sort of optimism, this like leaning in, mm-hmm. um, and that lack of pretension. Mm-hmm. You know, it was so distinct, um, and you know, I didn't get to spend a lot of time with Al, but I've spent more time with Steve Jenowick, mm-hmm. and he shared so much with me. Mm-hmm. Um, most of what I know about Al is through Steve. Sure. And, um, you know, my thought go, my thoughts go out to Steve right now. He, yeah. He just must be really dealing with it right now. Mm. Um, it didn't, it kind of didn't ever seem like Al would go. He'd I sort know. of already broken the laws of physics. Um, he, you know, by just making records at 91 anyway. No. <laughs> you know what I mean? He, he was, was just, a kind of what the geneticists call a super healer. Yeah. And he he yeah. looked great. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, you know, in, in the 10 years I was in LA, I barely noticed a difference in his physicality. <laughs> I didn't notice him slowing down. I didn't notice him getting, um, you know, I didn't see any senescence. It was just, he was mm. just, he seemed the same to me on the day I arrived as the, as the last time I saw him, mm-hmm. you know, um, you know, I don't think he could have even said that of me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. So, um, remarkable dude. So he, he sort of had a mythic quality in that, you know, I mean, you look at an old person, you think, well, their time's almost up. And I never felt that with Al. Like mm. it never felt inevitable. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know. Not much more to say, F- you know, feel for Steve and... Um, and uh, and all the people at Capitol who got to who who, who worked with him closely and yeah um a big loss and I and I wish I wish there was a way to convey to to young people looking at screens how important he was you know how how sort of impressive he was to watch work and to and to watch him engage with people where you know where the music lives mm. in those rooms, not inside, not inside in a, a set of plugins on a window. I wish there, there could be some kind of gathering and tribute, you know, mm-hmm. can there not be? I'm, I'm sure there will be 
some kind of formally narrative type things, um, which again will be like those weddings that we won't attend. Yeah, but again, <laughs> I think about our I think about our sort of corner of the mm-hmm. our community. Like, it's the kind of thing you would want to do, you mm-hmm. know, um, to honor someone who's paved the way in such a substantial way. And mm-hmm. um, let's talk about that off mic. Give everyone that focal point, and yeah, I don't know if there's been like good documentary work done you know, something that we can view or, um, I want to live in the world where people do that. Well, know? I mean, we plan to get Steve on here anyway. Um, yeah. So, you know, maybe we dedicate some of that time. Um, Steve just, uh, you know, always has so much to share about Al because he's, he's, you know, clearly loves the dude and, and was proud to have worked with him and learned so much from him and he shares it effortlessly so freely, yeah. it's not it's, yeah. it won't be a grind to him to right. to tell us great things about Al yeah. and tell us the things that he learned because he's done it over and over for you and I mm. um, so let's at least do that mm. you know when the, when the dust settles and yeah um, hmm. yeah Michael I don't want to forcibly bring you in but I'm going to forcibly bring you in you're smoking your pen there yeah, no, I thought that was a cigar a I was like what is that a <laughs> cigarillo ones now. <laughs> um, there's some nights where I have nothing and um, I don't really have anything for you you went hard today I mean the bit the bits I saw you guys talk about sparring we were we were talking about MMA and boxing at dinner you guys were <laughs> were were mm-hmm. in it uh, you know, I, I could barely keep up when I, I would drop in for 10 minutes at a time. It's like, whoa, fuck. Yeah, I spilled a whole glass this of is, water all over yeah, myself. Like, it was really, it was fucking intense. This wave was moving fast. I was like, yeah. you can you can dry it as we talk. He's like, no, mm. it's good. it feels good. Baby buys his first piece of jewelry and suddenly it's like. <laughs> Just the heat coming off and <laughs> steam rising, evaporating. Uh, yeah, it's been a long one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I don't know. It might be a good good place to. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think wind that's up. a nice I mean, ending tribute. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm down with that. Um, mm. I yeah, let me say that that it's a sad day, but also, if any of us get to 91, I'll be happy. If we get to 91 and we're a tenth as engaged mm. and alive and as creative as Al, mm. I'll be ecstatic. You know what I mean? So um, I, I I would be at pains to say that it's a celebration of, of all that he, he was. Indeed. Uh, and and then the fact that these records live on, you know, in, in the in the and in, in a way without you know, his his imprint is so delicate on these records. They mm-hmm. couldn't have happened without him, but he's not all over them. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't have his signature snare sound. You know, blasting on on everything from the seventies. You know what I mean? It's yeah, like yeah. they're they're the sounds of the, the of the artists coming through, and that's that's a big service. That's what we're that's a service to something something greater, and that's what we're Indeed. talking about and trying to do. So, I guess I want to say that we're we're celebrating him and and not lamenting because uh, he's a he's a role model for all of us. Yeah, very much um, so. In any, in any creative field, I mean, when I see, you know, Werner Herzog or any of these people, it's like, fuck yeah, man, go. Mm-hmm. I want to be I want to be as engaged as you when I'm your age, you know? Um, and I was one of those. All right, dudes. Cheers to that. Thanks. Cool. Thanks for it. All right, until next week. Good night, guys. Log us off. Conversations is produced and mixed by Dylan Seals. The Conversations theme was performed and recorded by the Hazelrick Brothers.